Hello, this is Dr. Singarum, pediatrician. Today I'll be discussing about enteric fever or the more commonly called name is typhoid fever. Coming to the etiology of this condition, as you all must be knowing, it is commonly caused by Salmonella enterica var typhi. But please remember 20% of the cases are caused by Salmonella paratyphi, which includes paratyphi A, B and C. Humans are the only known reservoirs for this particular condition and the mode of spread is by fecal oral route. A little bit about the pathogenesis of this condition. Suppose this is the bacteria. The bacteria first infects the intestinal epithelial cells, this area. Now after infecting the intestinal epithelium, it proliferates in the mesenteric lymph nodes here. After proliferation inside the mesenteric lymph nodes, it enters into the bloodstream and that is what we call it as primary bacteremia. Basically remember Salmonella is an organism which is going to affect the reticular endothelial cells. So in the primary bacteremia phase where it is going to cause problems are one is in the liver, second is in the spleen and third is in the bone marrow. And this is from where the clinical features of this particular condition are going to start from. Suppose you have not identified a typhoid fever in this phase of illness. What happens then happens is the secondary bacteremia phase, okay, which again is the proliferation of the bacteria in the blood vessels again. This is what we call it as secondary bacteremia and during the secondary bacteremia phase is the phase where the organism is going to disseminate into the other organs and that is when we call it as a complicated or a severe form of typhoid fever. Right. So I, I think you are able to understand the pathogenesis of the salmonella infection. Now coming to the clinical features, what I have given in the description is a very classical feature which is nothing but the temperature recordings in a child with enteric fever. You can see on the first day the temperature is increasing, second day the temperature is increasing, third day also the temperature is increasing. So with every subsequent day the temperature is increasing but the point to be noted is when compared to the previous day, the next day the temperature is higher. That means the peak temperature obtained in the subsequent days is higher when compared to the previous day's temperature. And this is what we characteristically called as a step ladder pattern of fever in enteric fever. Step ladder pattern of fever in enteric fever. Make a note of this. The second point to be noted here is these children also exhibit something called relative bradycardia. What is the meaning of this relative bradycardia? We are expecting tachycardia whenever there is a fever. The relationship is something like this. For every 1 degree rise in the temperature, the heart rate increases by around 10 to 15 beats per minute. But this increase is not observed in case of entry fever and that is what we call it as relate to bradycardia. Other than this, the features noted in case of entry fever are one is a distended abdomen, which is what we call it as a tummy abdomen, then white coating of the tongue. And one more feature which you can notice is hepatosplenomegaly. Even though it is not commonly observed in our population, another important feature of this enteric fever is something we call it as a rose spots named after the color which is usually seen over the trunk during the course of illness in enteric fever. So coming to the investigations in case of enteric fever, as with any other fever, when you do the blood count, you will notice a characteristic finding. What is that? Unlike other bacterial infection where you generally expect an increase in the WBC count, here there are normal WBC count or even low WBC count. And one more important finding noted is esnopenia. So in the first instance, it may appear even like a viral fever. But the point to be noted is that in case of entry fever, there is usually associated ESR and CRP which differentiate it from the viral infection. Another feature which can be noted is if you do the liver function testing, the liver enzymes will be elevated. It's not too much elevated, but elevated to something like two to three times the normal. And please note for your exams, SGOT is typically more elevated compared to SGPT. This is something which is important and should be noted. So what do you think are the definitive investigations which can be done? These investigations include the blood culture and the PCR. If they ask you the question, what is the gold standard for diagnosis of enteric fever? Your answer should be blood culture. Without any doubt, it is always the blood culture. But there are a few important 
issues which should be noted regarding blood culture. Please remember salmonella is something which can be easily grown with the help of the bile broth media or the automated systems like Bactech. But the problem is you have to take at least 5 ml of blood in case of children or 10 ml of blood in case of adults. That is the only thing which should be particularly noted. Second important thing is regarding the sensitivity of blood culture. Please remember the overall sensitivity of the blood culture is only 50 percentage. This is a point which should be noted. It's only 50 percentage and the sensitivity is much more in the first week of illness compared to third or fourth week of illness. The other investigation which can be done is PCR. PCR actually detects the antigens in the salmonella typhi and it is considered to be more than 90 percentage. It is considered to be more than 90 percentage sensitive. Are able to follow this? So if they ask you the question, which is a better sensitive investigation, answer is PCR. But which is a specific investigation, then your answer is automatically blood culture. Coming to the serology of uh, enteric fever, you all must be knowing about this very important test called the Vidal test. What is basically Vidal test? Vidal test detects the antibodies against the O antigen, which is the somatic antigen in cellular typhi, and against the H antigen, which is a flagellar antigen. So it basically detects anti-O titers and anti H titers. Please note for your exams, anti O titers rise early and decline early in the course of illness, whereas anti H titers they rise late and decline late in the course of illness. What is considered as a positive vidal when the antibody titer is more than 1 is to 160, then it is considered as positivity in the present scenario. But please remember, vidal test should never be done in the first week of illness because its sensitivity is very, very low in the first week of illness. So if they ask you the question, is vidal test diagnostic of entry fever? Your answer is going to be no because false positive vidal test has been observed in situations like false positive vidal test has been observed in situations like in malaria, typhus and in other bacteremias also. So what is the actual usefulness of the vital test is that it has got a high negative predictive value. That means if the vital test is negative in the appropriate clinical setting, you can actually rule out the diagnosis of enteric fever. So this point should be noted very clearly and it's an important exam question as well. What is the usefulness of vital test? It has got high negative predictive value. The other test include Typhi dot test which is a rapid enzyme immunoassay and detects IgG and IgM antibodies to the antigens of salmonella typhi. What we are now using is Typhi dot M test which selectively measures the levels of IgM antibodies against salmonella typhi antigen. This test has got a very good sensitivity of 95 percentage and it is now being routinely done in many of the centers. The other test include Latex agglutination test which has got a sensitivity of 100% so it is supposed to be one of the best screening tests available. So the latex agglutination test has 100% sensitivity. And what is the next one? It is IDL Tubex test which is based on O9 antigen and it is supposed to be extremely specific test. But the limitation of this test is again they are not very commonly available and not very commonly used also. So commonly used tests are vital test and the typhi dot M test. Patient can develop complication from typhoid fever which include the GI complication and neurological complication. Gastrointestinal complication usually occur in the second usually occur in the second or third week of illness and it is usually in the form of a GI bleeding. Now this bleeding occurs due to necrosis necrotic payers patch which is eroding through the wall of the vessel so it is usually bleeding and if neurological complication occur then it is termed as a severe enteric fever the neurological complication usually result in delirium coma and obtundation okay right so complications are characterized by the presence of GA and or neurological involvement now coming to a very important topic in this salmonella typhi infection is the condition of antibiotic resistance. 
please note that the initial antibiotic which was used in typhoid fever was chloramphenicol to which the bacteria became resistant within a few years. Then we tried cotrimoxazole and amphicillin but at present most of the bacteria are MDR typhoid which means they are resistant to the usual first line agent. What were the first line agent which were used? They include chloramphenicol, cotrimoxazole and amphicillin. Now the bacteria have become resistant to all of this medication that is what we call it as MDR typhoid. Okay, right. Now then people started using fluoroquinone. Now the bacteria have become resistant to that also. And the, what are the newer resistant strains? The newer resistant strains include the H58 clad of Salmonella typhi which is carrying this resistant plasmids okay the plasmids actually carry this multi-drug resistant genes and mutation and now they are causing fluoroquinolone resistant also so nowadays the antibiotic which is going to be used is the third generation cephalosporins now what is the problem the problem which we are actually will be facing in future in some countries are reporting it already is what we call it as a xdr typhoid xdr typhoid means a salmonella typhi which is resistant to third generation cephalosporins also that is called xdr typhoid this is partly due to inappropriate use of the antibiotics also so you should know the terms mdr typhoid the newer resistant strain which is the h58 clad and xdr typhoid which is a potentially a dangerous problem which is going to occur in the future if not antibiotics are going to be used properly so as I told you, at present, the treatment of choice is third generation cephalosporin. If the patient is a well child, if the patient is well, we are using oral cefixin. Suppose the patient is sick and you are going to put him as inpatient, the treatment of choice is a parenteral third generation cephalosporin, which is usually ceftriaxone or cefotaxin. And you should also know about the duration of treatment in case of typhoid fever. Suppose you are going to use an oral antibiotic like cefixin, the usual duration is 14 days. And if you are going to put ceftrioxone, the duration of treatment is one week after the fever resolves. So please note the duration of treatment in case of a typhoid fever. Suppose in a patient where uh, the third generation cephalosporins are not responding, then the antibiotic which is going to be helpful is azithromycin. The usual duration of azithromycin is 7 to 10 days. Make a note of that. Please remember the key for management or control of typhoid is prevention of typhoid fever in the first place. This is with the help of wash. What is wash? What wash is actually water, sanitation, hygiene. Because you all know that the root of spread of typhoid is fecal oral root. So that is why this wash, water sanitation and hygiene is the most important uh, preventive method. And vaccinations are available in the prevention of typhoid fever which is now uh, being recommended in almost all children. What are the vaccines which are available? The first vaccine is typhoid conjugate vaccine which is indicated in children more than six months of age and this is at present the recommended vaccine then next is polysaccharide vaccine which is called VIPS which is typhoid polysaccharide vaccine and it is indicated for children above two years of age one more vaccine is live attenuated oral typhoid vaccine which is called TY21A vaccine which is currently not available in India and this is a vaccine which can be used only in children more than 6 years of age. So at present what is the recommended vaccination? It is typhoid conjugate vaccine. So in summary, typhoid fever is a very important public health problem and antibiotic resistance is the major concern. So appropriate use of antibiotics is always advised. The next is the Vidal. As I told you before itself, 
it has got a high negative predictive value in typhoid fever the gold standard is of course going to be blood culture but always remember low rate of positivity in the blood culture especially when you do after the first week of illness always remember prevention is the key it is the water sanitation and hygiene which holds the key in prevention of typhoid fever and please remember vaccination is also advised and this is my facebook page called crop by dr singaram and i have a telegram group also pediatric recent trends the links i have given below in the description please like this page and subscribe to this please like this pages and subscribe to this channel uh, and please tell me whatever topics you need so that i can discuss in the future also thank you